It is Resurrection Sunday, and it is a day of celebration. And as we ended our time on Friday evening, we noted through the very powerful words of S.M. Lockridge that on Good Friday, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And Sunday is here. And if you have your Bibles handy, we're going to look for a few moments at 1 Peter chapter 1. We here at Calvary Chapel Tustin have a word that we focus on each year. And our word this year happens to be the word blessed or blessed. And it is the opening word of our set of three verses we'll look at this morning. Now, our text requires a bit of a historical backdrop for us to see through the history how this uh, personally applies to us this morning. And Peter opens the first of his two letters in the New Testament with the following words. In 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, Peter identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he issues a letter to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit. For obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Now, Peter addresses his letter to a collective group of Christians in various regions and labels them first as the dispersion. Now, the Greek word translated into dispersion simply means the scattered or to be scattered abroad. And thus, Peter was writing to persecuted Christians who had been scattered throughout the Roman Empire because they had just been accused by Nero of being responsible for the burning of Rome, which had just taken place prior to Peter's writing. Now, because of this, growing persecution was at hand, and Peter will later remind them in this letter not to think that persecution is strange, and we'll read the actual verses in a few moments, but rather that it's something to be expected. It's part of the Christian experience because we are, as Peter will describe us, as pilgrims. We are foreigners on this earth, so to speak, and aliens in the world. He reminds the reader that they are actually citizens of heaven. They are a royal uh, aristocracy because they are children of God. And in this life, they are likened, as I said, to pilgrims. But their citizenry is actually of an unearthly kingdom. He'll go on to describe to the people of the dispersion and to you and I that we are living stones. He'll call us a holy priesthood, a people of God's own possession. And as a result, the world cannot tolerate them. So they are the object of the world's hostility, but nonetheless, they are not to fear in the face of threats of persecution. They are not to be intimidated. They are not to be troubled by the world's animosity. They are not to be afraid when they suffer, and they are not to be ashamed when they are ridiculed and attacked because they believe Jesus is alive. In an effort to lift their spirits and their souls and sweep their hearts and minds upward where they belong, he begins with what we would call a doxology. And the term doxology simply means glory words. And he was giving them reminders of the hope that we have in a resurrected Lord. And the mechanism he uses, or the device, if you will, that he uses to lift their minds off of the moment and back onto heaven is indeed that Christ is alive. He is risen from the dead. Now he tells the church again they have a living hope. He tells the church they have an incorruptible inheritance. And he tells the church that they are going to be kept by God through the power of God through faith. Now this triad of hope, if you will, gives some realities that we'll be reminded of here this morning. And that is simply that the resurrection is not simply a historical event. It is a present reality. Christ is still alive. He is still on the throne. He is still interacting with his creation today. And this morning, our examination is going to be titled, The Power of the Resurrection. We're going to see the power of the resurrection and how that power continues to impact lives today. Now, the day in which we live is not unlike that of which Peter was writing to. There's growing persecution, case in point Sri Lanka, just this morning of Christians around the world. There are increasing efforts to silence the church by misrepresenting what the church stands for and what we believe, even in our country today. And therefore, you and I are in need of a living hope this morning. Amen? Now, Luke tells us 
on this day that we commemorate this morning. In Luke 24, 1 to 7, that on the first day of the week, Sunday, very early in the morning, another gospel says before it was light, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus, and it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, to behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Somebody say amen this morning. Now listen, the power of the resurrection is also highlighted for us in that it was not only foretold by the prophets, it was also foretold by Jesus himself. And thus, our living hope is based on the fact that Christ is not among the dead. He is risen indeed. So would you stand this morning in respect and honor of the infallible word of God and read our text with me this morning as we look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Read along with me, please. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And Lord, we ask now that you would Add your blessing to the reading of your word and give ears to hear to those who need to know the living hope today or even be reminded of it. We thank you, Lord, that every word on every page of your scripture is authored by the Holy Spirit, though a human held the pen. We thank you that what we are about to embark upon is a journey through the inspired word. Speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, as Peter seeks to encourage the church in this growing tide of persecution, he does what we must also do to lift our hearts when life is difficult, to lift our minds when circumstances are bleak, above the moment and on to God, which is the source of our hope. He reminds us that it is through the Lord's abundant mercy that he has begotten us again. That's just another way of saying being born again or being born of the spirit. And he says being born of the spirit grants us access to a living hope made possible through or proven by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And Romans 8, 11 would also remind us that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now lives in us. Now, Paul also would say in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 8, added to what, adding to what Peter has told us this morning, where he said, for, for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, or Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present. There were most of those 500 are still alive. But some have fallen asleep or died. After that, he was seen by James and by all the apostles. And last of all, Paul says he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Paul wasn't one of the original 12. How he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus outside of that on the Damascus Road, we do not know. But we do know that the Lord had privately tutored him in some form or fashion. And Paul beyond the realm of the original apostles tells us that Christ was alive and he had seen him and he wasn't some sort of phantasm or ghostly apparition that the deluded disciples had seen. Now we've made the point many times of the inseparable relationship between hope and truth because the fact is hope that is based on lies will not endure. Hope must be based on truth Truth must be based on facts. And that means that the eyewitness evidence of Christ's resurrection from the dead combined with eyewitness evidence 
of Christ's ascension into heaven gives us no reason to doubt what we have not seen yet believe. We haven't seen the resurrected Lord, but as a believer, someday we will see him face to face. Now in Hebrews 1, 1 to 4, we're told what it is that we have received and believe in. And that is God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. In other words, Jesus is the physical manifestation of the triune Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. What a wonderful description of the Father. The majesty on high. Having become so much better than the angels as he by inheritance has obtained a more excellent name than they. Listen, Jesus is not in the tomb. Amen. Amen? The tomb they laid him in wasn't even his. He borrowed it from a friend because he only needed it for the weekend. <laughs> He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he is very much alive today. Now, as we mentioned with Paul, so too was true with Stephen. He bore further witness to Jesus' resurrection from the dead outside of the 40 days when Jesus presented himself alive through many infallible proofs after he was seen by 500 people on one single occasion. But we're told in the book of Acts that the stoning of Stephen for his testimony of Jesus in 55 and 56, he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, consistent with what Hebrews would later record, and said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, this tells us that as those who, according to God's abundant mercy, who are born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, that the power of the resurrection as it is working in us today means this to you and means this to me. Listen to this very appropriate and applicable point to us all. Because Jesus is alive, we no longer live under the circumstances. We can now live above them. Because Jesus is alive... We no longer live life under the circumstances. We can now live above them. Have you ever greeted someone and said, hey, how you doing? And they said, well, pretty good under the circumstances. Well, listen, as a Christian, we can say, well, what are you doing under there? Get out from under the circumstances. Live on top of them. Jesus is alive, and he is seated at the right hand of majesty on high. Listen, many people today live their entire lives with an outlook that is totally based on circumstances and how things are going for them. When things are going well, they're happy. When things aren't going so well, they are unhappy. Yet as a Christian, because Christ is risen, we have a living object of our hope. And therefore, as we mentioned in our introduction, Peter would remind us of this. 1 Peter 4, 12 to 13, Peter said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But, what's the next word? Rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Now listen, the power of the resurrection is not just an assurance that there's an afterlife, though it is definitive proof about that. It is also the power to change our outlook in this life. Remember who Peter was writing to. He addressed his letter to scattered saints, saints who were on the run with the threat of violence and death on their heels. And Peter said, hey, don't think this is some kind of strange thing. And shouldn't be a part of the Christian life. Don't act like this is something strange that happened to you. But rejoice that somebody sees Jesus in you. And you are partaking of Christ's sufferings. Listen. Peter wrote to those who were facing difficulty in life. And he told them that gladness and exceeding joy is part of what they can embrace 
because Christ is not dead. He is risen. Listen, we can have joy and gladness in spite of our circumstances, though they may not be pleasurable or pleasant at the time. Look at verse 4 once again. Peter would go on to say that because of Christ's resurrection from the dead, we have an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved where? In heaven. For who? For you. I hope you've made your reservations. Now, I think we all recognize that we live uh, in an increasingly online world. If you don't think so, just go to a restaurant. How many times do you see families all seated at a table doing this? Or see a group of kids walking down the street, not even paying any attention to where they're going, but they're all on their devices seeing what is going on out there in the world. I'm sure some of you have probably had the online experience of making a purchase. And when the product was delivered, it was nothing like what you saw in the picture. Some time ago, we had this very experience in our own house. We had ordered some chairs to put in our living room. And when they arrived, the color was perfect. The design was just like the picture. But they looked like the kid size version of what belonged in some kid's room and not our living room. They looked like they were for a dollhouse instead of our house. Now, I share that with you for this reason. What we read and know about heaven is exactly the opposite. There are no words to describe what awaits us when we arrive there, even though the Bible gives us various word pictures to describe heaven. But we need to remember that because of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, we have reservations for an incorruptible and undefiled eternal existence there. And it is a place that is nothing like the earth. As a matter of fact, Revelation 22, 12 to 17, Jesus said, And behold, I am coming quickly. And that word quickly means suddenly or without announcement. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Then he likens himself unto the Father, where he uses a term often associated with God the Father, where he says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter into the gates of the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Just in case anybody was wondering who's speaking, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. Then he describes himself as the descendant of David through the phrase, the root and the offspring. He describes himself as the bright and morning star symbolizing new life. And the spirit and the bride say, come and let him who hears say, come and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. That's a pretty good proposition, wouldn't you say? Now, I'm sure we've all heard of somebody who has a bucket list today. Things they want to see or do before they kick the bucket. Everybody's heard the phrase bucket list? You know, I don't know that we'd be so quick to make a bucket list if we understood that kicking the bucket is associated with being hanged. They would kick the bucket out from neath, uh, underneath someone who was hanging by a rope around their neck. But either way, we still have our bucket list today. Now, not that there's anything wrong with having a list of things you want to do in life or accomplish in life. I've had some things that I would have liked to have done. Many of them are crossed off the list, so to speak, and uh, had the pleasure of traveling and speaking around the world and things of that nature. And we all have those types of things. But let me remind you of something here this morning. No one, say no one, no one, when they get to heaven is going to say, Man, I'm sure glad I got to see Europe before I got here. <laughs> no one, say no one. No one is going to say when they get to heaven, I'm sure glad I finally was able to buy my dream car before I got here. Nobody's going to say anything like, like that. Because the fact is, heaven's streets are not made of pavement. They're made of gold. The New Jerusalem's foundations are not concrete or block, but they're made of jewels. The gates in heaven are not made of wrought iron. They are comprised of a single pearl. We've never seen anything like it. There are no words to describe it. And listen, when we get there, most of all, we're going to see God. Listen, 
The Bible also says in Revelation 21, 22 to 26, John says, I saw no temple in it, the new Jerusalem, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written where? In the Lamb's book of life. Listen, this describes an exclusive group who will live forever in a glorious place. Now, it's not because they're the cream of the crop of humanity. And it's not because they are better than everyone else. Those who occupy heaven are going to have one feature in common, but be very distinct from one another, most likely in many other ways. And that one shared feature is that they will all be born again. They will be begotten again to a living hope. And listen, this uncorruptible or incorruptible and undefiled eternal existence does not fade away. We're told it's reserved for us in heaven. Now, the word reserved is a word in the Greek that we're familiar with here at the church. We often discuss it because it's important and it underscores uh, some very important truths regarding the word of God. And the Greek word reserved is the word tereo. And again, associated with the word of God, it means to guard from loss or injury. But it has a figurative meaning as well, which is the case in our verses. It means to maintain custody. Now, what that means is that the custodianship of this non-fading eternal existence is reserved by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now that brings us to the second thing we need to remember on this day of celebration, and that is this. And here's a word to the wise to some who are with us this morning, even those online. Listen, a living hope cannot be found through a dead Savior. A living hope cannot be found through a dead Savior. And one of the difficulties that many have with Christianity today is its, it's exclusive claim to being the only way of salvation. Many say, well, that's an elitist type of thinking. It's condescending of other religions. Well, listen, the Mormons say the same thing about what they believe. They think they're the only way. The Muslims say the same thing about their religion. Think about it. That's why there are other religions, because they think all the other ones are wrong. Everybody thinks that way. Everybody thinks their way is the exclusive way, except a handful who are kind of a goulash of all belief systems. The Rosicrucians would fall under that category and other groups as well. Yet, interestingly, nobody's attacking the Mormons and the Muslims for making the same claims that Christians make. Yet, Joseph Smith, Muhammad, Buddha, and every other founder of a religion is still in their grave, but Jesus is alive. Now, this is why he would say to his disciples in John 14, 1 to 6, at the head of the Passion Week, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And what Jesus was saying is, listen, as Jews, I know you have an understanding of God the Father. You need to believe the same exact thing about me. He'll go on to say, I and the Father are one. And if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Believe also in me, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said, and I love that Thomas says this, Lord, we have no clue what you're talking about. Very loose paraphrase. He said, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am a way. Is that what he said? No, he said, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Listen this morning, if you're here today, and many of you are, <laughs> you're thinking, why should I become a Christian? What's the matter with what I believe? The problem is you can't have a living hope through a dead Savior. Jesus is alive. Jesus is God. And thus Jesus and Jesus only can say, I am the only and exclusive way anyone can gain an inheritance that is 
incorruptible and undefiled in heaven. Now, there may be some here today, like many people, who've made up their own belief system, which is widely popular today. And it stems from a combination of what the Bible says and your opinion. I've often said some people's favorite book in the Bible is Second Opinions, even though it's not in the Bible. But John 8, 51, Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone, what's the next word? Keeps my word, he shall never see death. Remember our Greek word from a moment ago, terao? To guard from loss or injury, there it is right there. If anyone guards from loss or injury, my word, he shall never see death. The death that is in view here is the second death or eternal death. In other words, listen this morning, you can't write your own Bible. You can't define your own doctrines. You can't use a cut and paste approach to God's holy word and expect to receive the same things as those who have guarded the word from loss or injury. Now, if you want to have a living hope that includes living a life above the circumstances because you know you have an inheritance reserved in heaven for you, then that inheritance is connected directly to the belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, as well as all that the Bible says. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 19, Paul, the apostle, would also write, Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead... How do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? There was a group of Jewish leaders that didn't believe in angels, anything supernatural or the resurrection from the dead. But if there is no resurrection from the dead, listen close, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, Paul says that our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have died in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Paul is saying there is no hope in a dead Savior. And to put your trust in someone or even a belief system where the founder doesn't even have the power to defeat death, that's nothing more than a pitiful existence. But Jesus is alive. And because he is alive, we can now live life above the circumstances and not under them. And we can know that we have reservations in heaven because the one who made our reservations in his own blood is seated there in glory. He's not laying somewhere dead in a grave. Now, verse 5, one last thing, and I'll let you get off to uh, the chocolate you're going to consume in mass quantities this afternoon. Now... Peter then adds, this reservation in heaven for us because of the resurrection of Christ from the dead reminds us that we are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, another insight from the Greek, and if you're a visitor with us this morning, the Old Testament was mostly written in Hebrew. Uh, There's a portion of Daniel written in Aramaic, and the New Testament was written in the Greek language, and that's why we refer back to the Greek terms at some times. And an insight worth noting, the word kept here is phoreo, and it's not the act of being kept that is meant by this word. It's actually referring to the one who does the keeping. The word actually means a watcher. It can be translated as a guard or a sentinel. Now, the context then attaches the role of the watcher, guard, or sentinel to the one who is all-powerful, or God, who guards our salvation from fading, which is going to be fully revealed in the last time. Now, I couldn't help but think of a story some of you, I'm sure, have heard at some point of a man who knew that someone had Uh, gone off to work one day and he was a burglar and he broke into this house and he was creeping around trying to be silent and unnoticed and suddenly he heard a very odd sounding voice somewhere off in the distance say Jesus is watching the man said who said that well he turned around he couldn't find anybody and he started rummaging through the man who had gone off to work's things and suddenly he hears the voice again Jesus is watching and the man whirls around again. It happens again a third time, yet he can't find anything. And finally, he tracks the sound down and finds that there is a birdcage in the corner of the family room. And he takes the cover off. And there's this beautiful parrot standing there on his perch. And he says, whew, it was you. 
He said, what's your name? And the bird says, Methuselah. The man walks away shaking his head and says under his breath, what kind of weirdo names his parrot Methuselah? Then he hears a voice behind him say, the same kind of weirdo that names his Rottweiler Jesus. (laughs) It's good to know that Jesus is watching, amen? Now, we're told our salvation is fully secure. It's reserved in heaven. It's being kept by God who is playing sentinel over our salvation. Yet we're also told it's not fully realized. And what that means is the best is yet to come. And while we are now completely saved, we are not yet enjoying the fullness of all that our salvation has given to us, which is going to require a change of address and a change of garment, meaning our bodies. We're going to receive immortal incorruptible versions, a serious upgrade on what we have now. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, this also gives us the opportunity to correct some errors concerning the issue of faith. As Peter says, you're kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. Now, sometimes today, it seems like faith, to hear some preachers tell it, is more like magic than acting upon the established word of God. You would think to hear some, and by the way, the Greek word for faith is pistis. It means a reliance upon Christ for salvation and a constancy of that profession in the context of our verses. But you would think that faith is actually the ability to create eternal rewards in this temporal world. Now, you can have faith in things that aren't true. You know that? You can have faith in things that are an out-and-out lie. As a matter of fact, billions of people are believing lies today. There's 1.4 billion Muslims who believe in something that cannot be substantiated and hasn't been proven by a resurrected establisher of that religious system. Muhammad's grave is still occupied. Jesus' tomb is empty. You can have faith in things that aren't true. Now, listen, let me just give you an example. Let's say you are fully convinced in your mind and you're sincere in your belief that red lights mean go and green lights mean stop. You can believe that and be sincere in that belief and you can believe it with all your heart and mind. But let me just give you a little piece of information. It's going to be a rough drive home no matter what you believe. (laughs) If you act on that which you have faith in. Now, faith actually is described for us in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Now, faith is action that coincides with truth. Truth is found in the word of God. Faith is not believing in something strongly enough that you can make it happen, including creating health, wealth, and power. Now, Romans tells us in 8, 19 to 25, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. In other words, the whole world needs to be delivered from its declining state. Because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption and of the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know... But the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, which is the redemption of our bodies. There's the upgrade I was talking about. We were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Perseverance just means cheerful endurance. How can we have cheerful endurance in a world that is largely against us? Because Jesus is watching. God is the sentinel. And therefore, cheerful endurance can be ours. And it should be a description of our eagerly awaiting the redemption of our bodies. Now... That means that the power of the resurrection includes this in conclusion. Listen, here's one of the blessings and benefits of being begotten again to a living hope. And that is we have the unshakable confidence that it is well with our souls. 
Because of the resurrection and belief in Christ crucified and resurrected and ascended, we have the unshakable confidence that it is well with our souls. Listen, if God is your guard and sentinel, then you have nothing to fear. And while we have examined a mere three verses this morning, they're taken from a larger context that has much more to say about the power of the resurrection than time would allow us this morning. But let me include the next few verses where Peter says to the scattered and persecuted saints and to us this morning. In 6 through 9 of the same chapter, he writes this, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you do what? You love, though you, now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, which is what? The salvation of your souls. Now, the end result of our faith is the salvation of our souls, not a lifestyle of the rich and famous, at least not on the earth. When we get to heaven, we're going to walk on streets of gold. We're going to live in a city whose builder and maker is God, a city with 12 gates. Each gates, again, as we mentioned, consisting of a single pearl, a city whose foundations aren't concrete but precious stones. We'll live in a city. Think about this. We'll live in a city made out of things that people are killing themselves and sometimes others to obtain on this earth. We're going to live in a city where gold is as common as dirt, where precious stones are used for construction, not to make jewelry. And until then, we have a sentinel keeping us by his own power until all that is going to be ours and the salvation of our souls revealed in the end. So how can we have the unshakable confidence that it is well with our souls? Because we have a living hope. We're not serving a dead savior. We are serving a living king of kings and Lord of lords. And life, because of this hope, isn't lived under the circumstances. It's lived above them. And how do we know these things are so? How can the exclusive claims of Christianity as being the only means of salvation be true when other religious systems claim the same thing. And I hesitate to use the word religion regarding Christianity. But John 20, 24 to 29, we're told about Thomas called the twin. We've already met him once this morning. He was one of the 12. That was a name associated with the 12 disciples. They were referred to as the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. The others had already seen him, the ten others. Judas was dead. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here, Tom. Look at my hands. Reach your, reach your hand here. Put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Maybe there's some here today who are like, Thomas, you want more proof? Well, you can start with this. Go check the graves of those who have founded religions over the centuries. And all of them will say no vacancy. They are still occupied. There's one tomb that's empty today. And it was occupied momentarily by the inhabitant who is the king of kings and lord of lords who was the first to rise from the dead and is alive forevermore. And that's the tomb of Jesus. And Jesus came into this world in the likeness of flesh like you and I, wrapped and veiled his glory in human flesh momentarily. He died on a cross, a brutal death that he did not deserve. So he could rise again early in the morning on the first day of the week and conquer death for you and death for me. He later ascended into heaven in front of eyewitnesses. So it couldn't be said that he simply vanished and died later, but he was received up into glory, the glory that he had formerly with the Father before he came into earth in the form of a human. 
Now, the fact is, the power of the resurrection says this. Come to Jesus today, and he'll forgive you of your sins, and he'll change your eternal destiny from hell to heaven, and he will stand as a sentinel over your soul until you arrive there and stand in his presence someday and are forever with him. What's he ask of you? Well, the Bible clearly teaches that those who believe will have their belief manifested in the form of repentance. And repentance is a word a lot of people don't like to use today, but it is something that we need to understand. It means to change the mind, change the mind specifically about Jesus. Maybe you think Jesus is the same as Muhammad. Maybe you think Jesus is the same as Buddha. Maybe you think one religious person is the same as another. Well, the resurrection says you need to change your mind to say Jesus is the way Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. And if I want to go to the Father in heaven, I have to go through him. That's what the Lord is asking of you. Change your mind about Jesus. And the fact is, anything that you change your mind about, your life is going to change too. Listen, I can bear witness of that this morning. My life was far different than it is now. I was sharing this with a group on Good Friday night. My life was one that was consumed with alcohol and drugs and violence and I was a horrible husband and a horrible father and I would like to think now after 42 years of marriage I'm starting to grow on my wife a little bit and I think she even likes me but the fact is I'm nothing like I used to be and I'm thankful for it you see I repented I saw what was wrong in my life I saw how it displeased God which is the most important thing I saw how my life wasn't lined up with his word. I wasn't living according to the truth. I was living according to my own desires and the things that I wanted to do in my flesh. And listen, when I committed my life to the Lord, everything began to change, especially where I was going to spend eternity. And you can have that happen for you too. It's just simply an acknowledgement away. There's a lot of stuff done today now, let me just say this. There's a lot of people that have people come forward. A lot of churches have people come forward and stand here. A lot of churches have people pray a prayer. A lot of churches have people come down from the uh, stands in a stadium. A lot of people do a lot of things, and not that there's anything wrong with any of those. But let me just say this. Raising your hand doesn't save you. Praying a sinner's prayer doesn't save you. Walking down onto a field doesn't save you. Jesus saves you, and you have to believe in him in order to be saved. All these other externals that I just mentioned are representing what has already happened in the heart. And the fact is, if you want to be saved this morning, if you want your sins forgiven this morning, it can happen right here and right now, and God will post himself as a sentinel over your life until you arrive home with him. I think that's a pretty good deal. It's the proverbial offer you can't refuse, and you shouldn't refuse because the consequences are grave. Now listen, what proof do we have? Why can we say such exclusive things? Jesus is alive. He's not in the tomb. He's no longer there. He is risen. Somebody say amen. amen. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the inspired words of Peter, who was eyewitness to the empty tomb as he ran there with John, peered in and found the grave clothes neatly wrapped, laying in a bundle where the head would used to lay or would normally lay inside of a tomb. And Lord, we thank you that we can look at Peter's life where only hours before he denied you three times, said he didn't even know you, used an oath to declare that he had no allegiance or association with you. And then here we find him later writing about the proof that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, because of the resurrection. And friend, listen, this morning, if you have not done maybe what a phrase you've heard but don't know what it means, Peter just talked about it this morning. We talk about it because Jesus used the phrase in John 3 about being born again. Peter just used a different term, begotten again. But it speaks of the fact that we are all born in the same state. We're all born spiritually dead. And that's what the Bible means when it says you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. 
The Bible goes as far to say in uh, 1 Corinthians that the Bible's not even going to make any sense to you unless you're born again. And that's why Jesus would say when he departed and the Holy Spirit would come, he would teach you all things and call to remembrance the words that he had spoken. The fact is, it is essential that we be born again. So the Bible outside of the gospel begins to make sense. It's pretty simple. And the gospel is a pretty simple message. You're a sinner. You need a savior. Christ is a savior and he's willing to save whosoever will may come. So saving implies something that we are being saved from. And that something is hell and eternal separation from God. And God so loves you and so loves me that he gave his only begotten son so that Whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So here's the deal. On this resurrection Sunday morning, if you would like to say yes to God's offer of forgiveness and salvation, I am going to ask you to just symbolize that by saying, you know what? I accept God's offer and I want to make a statement that I am now his and ask him to be the sentinel over my life from this day forward. So if you want your sin forgiven and know that at the end of your life, eternity in heaven awaits you, I'm just going to ask you to lift up your hand and say, that's me. I want it. I accept God's offer to me. Lift your hand up high where I can see it this morning. I want to pray for you before. I'm not going to ask you to come down here and stand or anything. God bless you. Anybody else this morning, just lift up your hand. Don't let this moment get by. This thing that we talked about in Sri Lanka this morning is just a sign about the perilous times in the last days that the Bible says we're going to come. So anybody else this morning, lift up your hand high. I want to pray for you before we go. God bless you. Anybody else? And Father, we are so thankful this morning that we have a living hope, a proven hope. We don't have a baseless faith because of words written by a human being. But we have a book inspired on every word and page of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, what Peter wrote as an eyewitness to your resurrection, we can be assured of and we can act on it by faith. And we thank you, Lord, that you remain yet even today the sentinel who guards our salvation until we receive the end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. We thank you, Lord, that there is but one way. And there are confusing things or conflicting teachings from one religion to another. And there's no difficulty in determining what is truth because yours is proven truth. You are alive and alive forevermore. And we can be that way too. So we thank you for the gift of salvation offered this morning. And we pray, Lord, for those uh, joining us online that Decisions to follow Jesus as the children so wonderfully sang this morning. And no turning back were made today. So we thank you. We honor you. We thank you for the proof you gave to us and that your book isn't filled with unsubstantiated claims, but facts that we can place our eternal souls in the hands of guarded by you. Thank you for your word this morning. We celebrate the resurrected Lord and thank you that Jesus is alive. We bless your holy name today and all God's people agree by saying, amen. amen. Hey, listen, if you raised your hand this morning or maybe you should have but didn't, I want to encourage you to come and chat with one of these handsome gentlemen off to my right, your left. These are elders of the church and they would love to chat with you, pray with you, answer any questions you may have, give you a Bible if you're in need of one. But today is a day of celebration. Jesus is alive. Amen. So go tell somebody. Go tell somebody he's alive. He's coming soon. Signs are all around us. It's an exciting time to be alive, to be sure. The Bible is leaping off the page. Its truths and realities are being revealed every single day. And all the evidence says, not only is Jesus coming again, He's coming again soon. That's why he said, therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that he's not expected. There's a low expectancy today of the return of Jesus Christ, which is prime time for him to come back and get us. And I say, even so, come get us, Lord Jesus. Somebody say, amen. Would you all stand?